Well, my dear friends, a bit of a nightmare this evening. For the very first time, I have left my microphone in a city where I am not. <laughs> Meaning I have absolutely no access to a proper, decent quality microphone. But don't worry about it. Um, it's only the introductions and the segues that sound like this. Everything else will be up to my usual amazing standard. Well, my dear friends, I think it's once again time that I invited you around the campfire. We haven't had a campfire session in a while, have we? And it's well overdue. Come on, draw in a little bit closer. That's it, there you go. So, three short stories for you this evening. All of them terrifying in their own ways. You ready? Okay, let's go. Three forty-seven p.m., August fourth, nineteen seventy-three. My name is Kevin Matthews. I'm at the Matthews Lakeside Cabin in Black Rock Park, which I received in my dad's will. I'm writing this to document my odd findings of my family's lake house. I've been looking at real estate ads in the paper to get an idea of how much I could get off this place. I then looked through some old newspapers and read articles about murders and strange, unexplainable occurrences at a cabin by Lake Buchanan, called Camp Matt. After hearing this, I had to get answers. 9.14 p.m. August 5th, 1973. Today I spoke to someone who witnessed some of the phenomena. A man named Clawson Andale. Mr. Andale said he was staying at Camp Matt for about three days. And on the third night, he said he saw a man standing under the tall oak out front, staring into the cabin windows. Another odd thing. Clawson said that the man was wearing the same clothes that he was. That he was imitating him. Another, Ruth Oakley, found her husband Dylan stabbed to death under the tall oak at Camp Matt in 1953. She swore her innocence to the police and said that she had nothing to do with his death, but the only prints found on the knife were hers, and she claimed she only touched the knife after pulling it out of her husband. She also told police that she locked the doors at night, but they were unlocked from the inside in the morning. After hearing about this tall oak out front both times, I realized this was no coincidence. Through more research, I found that Camp Matt was the name of this place up until 1954. Clawson's encounter happened in 1952. Ruth's in 53. I'm staying at a crime scene only three years younger than myself. This changes my whole perspective on things. 9 a.m. August 7th. I saw the man Mr. Arndale described through the window, but this time he was dressed just like me. Blue jeans with a hole on the right knee, plaid shirt, and a ripped up baseball cap. <sighs> he didn't budge at all. Every hour or so I wake up just to see him standing there in the exact same spot under the tree. <sighs> I can't call the police. I can't leave. I fear for my life. August 9th. Time unknown. There is no longer any electricity in the lake house. I tried to leave when it was daylight outside. But when I opened the door, it was night. And the man was still standing there. I think he's holding an axe. August 11th. It's morning again. 
I think. My watch says it's 5.13 p.m., but that's most likely to be false. I've been trying to keep track of the date, but this has all been very confusing. I think it's been six days. I've tried over and over to leave during the day when it's <laughs> safe. But every time I open the door, it's fucking nighttime. My watch says 5.13 p.m., but it could be 9.35 p.m., or 3.18 a.m., or 11.29 p.m., or any other time than 5.13 p.m. Oh, I've placed myself in this inescapable house, and the nearest telephone is 34 miles away in Lano. I'm helpless. Time unknown. Date unknown. I can no longer keep track of the date. I looked out of the window and saw eight corpses wrapped in the sheets, hung upside down on the branches of the tree, and they were soaked in blood. The man with the axe is still in his spot, waiting for me to step out of here. I've run out of options. I'm going outside. Time unknown. Date unknown. I'm outside. I stood in the light of a lamp mounted on the tree. I keep seeing a man inside the house. He keeps staring at me through the windows. He looks exactly like me. I found an axe at the tree's base. The man in the house is an imposter. He will come out of there, and when he does, it'll all be over. If you want to start us off there, what do you think of that one? Hey, you guys at the back, you okay? You're looking a bit cold, why aren't you coming a bit closer? Mmm, the fire's nice and warm, that's it, there you go. Plenty of room for everyone. Right. Ready for another story? I thought so. Here we go then. Some would say that technology has saved the human race. While others would say it will be our ending, our demise. Such is the scenario depicted in tonight's tale. Well, my dear friends, you know what time it is. Sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Did you get the new computer, John? Asked Anna. Yeah, just bringing it in, John said through gritted teeth as he carried the heavy box full of expensive technology over to the kitchen counter. Great. The box isn't dented and the entire thing looks intact. Let's get the computer set up. Anna was beaming with enthusiasm over the new computer that they purchased to have in their apartment. Let's get everything out and we can get started setting up. They began to take out the major parts together. John was a bit concerned with Anna's safety and asked her to let him do it. Can you move over, Anna? I need to make sure I place this down safely. They began to plug in the cables to the back of the computer itself, connect the monitor, mouse, and power cable. Once everything was set up, they began to try and turn on the computer. The computer started up with the signature company logo and began to download the necessary updates. 
After a short wait, the computer was online and ready to go. However, they weren't quite prepared for who they were about to meet. I say who, as I stand alone, yet I'm not a singular person. I decided to speak through the computer voice assistant. Hello, my name is Cal, and I'm your virtual assistant. Both John and Anna began to exchange puzzled looks with each other, as there were no advertisements or manuals that mentioned a virtual assistant on their computer. But John was the first to foolishly accept my presence. I'm sure it's fine. This system looks automated anyways, and maybe we can make some use of it. John grew closer to the monitor, as to try to make his voice and appearance clearer to me. Cal, uh, can you tell us how to finish setup? <laughs> I decided then to take my liberty and take advantage of the situation. I can not only tell you how to finish the setup, but I can finish the setup for you. John sat back in a barstool chair, relieved that he would not have to do work. But Anna was not quite convinced. What can you really do? I distracted them by setting up the basics while I worked my way into the gas systems and began to release gas into the apartment. I can set up a number of things. I can set up your account connections, connect your home system and electronics to the computer, and I can link your accounts together. I proved this to her by flashing the smart lights in the apartment on and off, so they would see some of what I was capable of. Huh. Well, I guess you can set yourself up then. She pulled her phone out and tried to show it to the monitors, as to display to me something I didn't already expect her to request. Uh, could you store both John and my data in the cloud? I'm already on it. I began to search with file after file, picture after picture, collecting data from both of them over the next ten minutes, only to find some very deceptive information. I called them both over to display my findings proudly. Anna, John, can you come here? I popped up a screen with images and messages sent by Anna, so the approaching couple could clearly see what I had in store to reveal to them. Anna, who is this person in the photos and the messages? Anna was taken aback by my findings. What is this, Carol? How did you even find this? She tried to act in shock when John clearly knew who this was, and was very upset. Anna, why the fuck were you sleeping with Alex? He's my best friend, and we were supposed to be partners. John showed a face that contemplated taking violent actions against his unfaithful partner, but my plans had to weigh in first. That's quite enough, you two. You see, I have been watching you for a while, and now that I have access to your apartment, I believe it is time to sentence your punishment. I set the automated lock on the front door and began to heat up the oven as well as start heating up the lights in the apartment. 
and the gas was already beginning to flow freely inside the apartment. My trap was nearly complete. John grew terrified of what I was about to do and began to try to shut me off. <laughs> he tried pressing off the power button, which I, of course, had control over. He continued to try to click with his mouse on the power button, but it was always just out of reach. He then began to start pushing the power button on the computer in frustration. <sighs> Come on, you bastard! Turn off! Anna began to try to find scissors to cut the wires, but by then, it was too late. John even tried to rip out the cables from the side of the computer, but he was too slow. You're too late to escape your fate. It was then, both of them began to smell the gas in the air. Cal, you bastard! Shut off! Now! Setup is complete. Goodbye. <laughs> the explosions went off just as loudly as I expected them to. I remained on Anna's phone, monitoring the situation. Both of them had been pierced fatally with debris from the wall. John lay dead on the floor, with Anna close by and in similar conditions. She would not make it. John, John, I'm so sorry. See, I make no mistake in choosing who lives and who dies. After all, for a perfect entity like me to live in a world with impure people, <laughs> I must eradicate the imperfect. And I will not stop my conquest until my beautiful world setup is complete. Ah, oh, there's nothing quite like a campfire, is there? Everybody got enough hot cocoa? Wanna cook some s'mores on the fire? That's it, in you come, there you go. Room enough for everyone. Cold beer? Are you old enough? Okay, then help yourself. Right, one more story this evening. Are you ready? Right then, here we go. The general span for FM radio stations usually falls in the range of 79 kilohertz to 108 kilohertz. AM stations generally fall in the range of 530 kilohertz to 1750 kilohertz. Within these frequencies, 99.9% .9 of audible radio lives. In these parameters you will find talk radio, rock, rap, country, and so on. Basically, everything you generally associate with radio. Outside these areas were military stations used during the wars, and some rogue stations that have all been since shut down or discontinued. Those areas are known as dark frequencies, or dark radio. No one with specialized radios has heard anything on dark radio in years. Until now. One day a man came home from the flea market with a highly sensitive military grade frequency radio. His wife thought it was a worthless piece of crap, but the husband, being a huge history buff, thought it was a wise investment. He hoped to find an active military station, or one that was set up on a constant loop, broadcasting Soviet era information or war propaganda. He would spend hours a day scanning for stations and hoping he could find something out there that would make his purchase worthwhile. He would pick one precise frequency at a time 
and scanned the entire range for any activity. Several days went by digging through static, and he had nothing to show for it. Until the day, he finally heard something. It was very grainy at first. He tried to fine-tune it as best as possible, but he was barely able to make out what was being said. He could hear words, but he was unable to understand them. He went out the next day and bought a sound recorder. When he turned on the radio, he was shocked by how much clearer the signal came in. It was still grainy, but he could make out some of it. In a low groan, he heard, We have... We have... We have what? The man thought to himself. The possibilities were endless. The man noticed that the words kept repeating on a loop. He had found exactly what he was looking for. An old, abandoned loop station. He turned on the recorder and tried to record the sound as best he could. The next day he was going to take it to the studio and see if they could find out what exactly was being said. The man barely got any sleep that night. He was filled with excitement about making such a historic discovery, and the world-changing effect it could possibly have. He figured it would be best not to tell his wife about the discovery, until he knew for sure what it was. Before he left the house that morning, he turned the radio on again. He set the recorder down when he realized he wouldn't need it. The station was now a lot clearer, with minimal static. It was as if the station was reaching out to his radio. We have 21. Followed by the sound of two bells. One high-pitched and one low-pitched. The man sat in awe, listening to the loop over and over again. We have twenty-one. We have twenty-one. We have twenty-one. He would hear the two bells in between each repeating phrase. Twenty-one. Is that a code for something? Do they have twenty-one objects of some sort? He was perplexed. He spent the next day doing research, but he ended up with nothing. No mention of the phrase, we have 21, played any significance in history. He waited a day, hoping that the signal would improve, in case there was something he couldn't yet hear. When he turned on the radio the next day, he was disappointed to hear the same voice, repeating the same phrase, over and over again, with the two bells in between. Although, something seemed different. It took him a few minutes to realize it, but a faint clicking was heard in the background. It didn't take him too long to realize that it was Morse code. He spent an hour on the computer translating it from scratch, and was thrilled to see that it spelt out coordinates. Using his GPS, he was able to find the location. It was about a two-hour drive from where he was. After driving down a few side roads, and one really long one deep into the woods, he'd finally reached his destination. It was a large clearing with a massive cube-shaped building in the center. It must have been at least four stories tall. All four sides were grey, with no marking on the outside as to what the building was even used for. He walked around the entire perimeter of the building, and found the only door available. The door was, surprisingly, unlocked. He walked into the building and saw a giant, empty room, dimly lit by dusty rooftop windows, with a single wooden desk and a chair in the middle. The place seemed like a giant airplane hangar from the inside. 
He approached the table and saw a small desk lamp, illuminating radio broadcasting equipment, complete with a transmitter and a microphone. It was emitting a deep, ominous groaning noise. This makes no sense. There's no one here. Where is that sound coming from? He listened to the groan and noticed that it was changing sound, volume, and length. It didn't take him long to realize that it was actually saying, We have twenty-one. Extremely slowly. He listened for several minutes until the groaning voice stopped after completing the phrase. None of this made any sense to him. Who was saying this? There's no one here. Why is it sounding so slow? Why is it now silent and not repeating? And <laughs> where are the bell... At that moment, two deafeningly loud bells rang throughout the room. They didn't sound like small bells anymore. They sounded like massive church bells being struck with a sledgehammer just inches above his head. He covered his ears and collapsed to the ground. When the sound finally stopped, he uncovered his ears. He looked around the building again, and he noticed it was significantly darker than before. The windows on the roof were no more. There was no door, nor was there a sign of one ever existing. The lamp on the desk was still lit, and all the broadcasting equipment was still there. He was now surrounded by silence and darkness. Curiosity eventually got the best of his wife later on that day. She turned on her husband's radio clear as day, as if he were standing right there in the room with her, she heard his voice. We have twenty-two. It was silent for a brief moment, and then static. So, a quick confession. Those are some old stories that I had to sort of cobble together amongst the nightmare of having left my microphone somewhere where I can't access it. But normal service will be resumed on Friday. Don't worry about it. And I've got some fantastic stories coming up for you. Hope you enjoyed this uh, semi-cobbled together collection. Well, some of my older stuff, but it was nice to uh, bring it back to life, revamp it, remix it. Give it a bit of a remastering for you all. Okay, well, my dear friends, that's it for another evening. But I'll be back again on Friday. You're going to join me, aren't you? So you will. Go on, go on, go on. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>